119, it's 73 through 80. <clears throat> if y'all want to stand, I guess, if, as I read. Your hands made me and formed me, giving me understanding, so that I can learn your commands. Those who fear you will see me and rejoice, for I put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your judgments are just and that you have afflicted my, me fairly. May your faithful love comfort me as you promised your servant. May your compassion come to me so that I may live, for your instruction is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame for slandering me with lies. I will meditate on your precepts. Those who fear you, let those who fear you, those who know your decrees, turn to me. May my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, so that I will not be put to shame. Y'all can turn and shake hands. Nobody tells Sarah I put coffee on her piano. I also, every week I get in and tinker around with some of the keys on the, uh, on the piano just to help her out. I tune it a little bit. <laughs> Good to be here, gathered to celebrate the Lord. Um, we are in the book of uh, Psalm, and in chapter 119. So we've been taking the, uh, the, the um, 119th chapter of Psalms very slowly, going through eight verses at a time. That's how the book is broken up. Uh, the book was designed to, in its original language, each of the verses would have started with, with one of the letters of the alphabet. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. They got ripped off by a couple. And so we work through that slowly, eight verses at a time. Um, today's passage picks up from this kind of concept of affliction, of struggle, of suffering, where we were last week. And for the Christian... That can feel strange, I think, in some ways. To think of suffering, to think of affliction, to think of struggling, it can feel odd at first to, this, to the Christian. But as you look across Scripture, you know, we see all over Scripture the idea that we're going to be tried, the idea that we're going to suffer, the idea that God allows affliction for us. And the psalmist even said last week that sometimes those afflictions are actually for our good. And that's encouraging. That's encouraging. This week, the psalmist focuses in on something that, um, well, he picks up from last week a little bit, but it's something that maybe you've experienced before, and that is that words, you know, we say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's not true. Words can be very hurtful. Words can do actual damage, too. Not just, 
emotional, making me feel bad, but someone's words about you can affect your character. That's why it's illegal to slander and libel someone. Words that are spoken about someone can affect everything about their reality. What people say, what people perceive of you can cause you to be treated differently, can affect your employment, can affect your status in the world. And so the psalmist is dealing with that. And he's talking to himself, actually. He's praying through this time in his life where he's being afflicted. And if you look through your scripture, if you read the book of James, the book of James talks about the power of the tongue. In fact, it says the power of Life and death are in the tongue. It talks about bridling the tongue. I don't know how many of us here are equestrian or rode a horse in this morning, but the concept of the bridle is that you control the head of the horse and that controls its direction. It's all that power in the horse, right? The way that cars are or were measured is bridled, is contained, is controlled, is directed by using this bridle. The power of the tongue. The book of 1 Peter talks a lot about suffering. A lot about suffering. And you read that book and, you know, we, we have this tendency, um, you know, uh, Ed, if you know Ed, um, talks often about ditches. There's these ditches. And if you can imagine a pendulum swinging over these ditches, there's each ditch has something that's wrong. Maybe it's legalism. It's thinking God loves me when I can behave better. Maybe it's license. Maybe it's God doesn't care. Somewhere between those ditches tends to be the truth. The book of 1 Peter talks about suffering. And we can tend to do one of two things, have one of two ditches. We can tend to say, well, we don't really suffer because we're not martyred. And so we stand a little taller and think, well, look, I don't count anything as suffering. Or maybe we had the other ditch where we think, oh, I'm so crushed by all of the suffering in my life. In the middle there is some truth. The book of 1 Peter that talks so much about suffering, if you spend some time this week in 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and look to verses 13 and 17, a lot of what he's talking about is slander, is evil speech against him. He's dealing with a period of suffering where people are speaking negatively about him. And maybe you've, maybe you've been affected by this kind of an affliction where people are saying things about you and others hear them and then they look on you and they see you differently. And, and maybe you felt the way that that feels. It, it gets inside you. It makes you feel frustrated. It can make you feel angry. It can make you feel really angry towards the person that's saying these things and you're thinking why would you believe this about me have I ever lived that way in front of you am I a hateful person why would you believe these things I think about how quickly the world is changing around us I know a guy one time who uses a used to use a now dated reference He said, one day you're going to come to church, and standing outside of church are going to be people likely in suits, probably dark suits, and they'll have a clipboard in their hand. And this is where it gets dated. Nobody has clipboards, so I'll update it. They'll have an iPad or an iPhone in their hand. And they'll take your name as you come in, and they'll be someone who's a representative from the United States government, and there will be no benefit to coming to church In fact, maybe it will change the way that you're perceived in the world. And I know this makes me sound insane, but these days are probably coming. You think about the power of of what's happening with, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and the ability to ingest massive amounts of film data and characterize people and determine things about them. The days are coming where it will be a hateful thing to be a Christian in the United States of America. It's coming and it's partially even here. Maybe we will be camped off and determined to be an unloving people. There's a a sign across town that says, Jesus did not reject people and neither do we. I wonder what people read when they see that. You know, if we believe that sin separates us from God, it would be unloving for us to not talk about sin. 
It would be completely unloving for me to not talk about sin. Now, there's a difference between talking about sin as someone who is sinless, which I am not, and which you are not. Only the man Jesus Christ has lived in this life without sin. We talk about sin with people as fellow sinners. And so when I tell someone, hey, because of what God says, this thing is a sinful thing that you participate in, that is the most loving thing I could do. Now, there's a lot of ways to say that, right? You can say something in a way that puts a stick in the, in the ground and says, I'm anchored on this, and I will say it in an obtuse and rude way, and you will then react negatively to that, and we'll never talk again. Or I can walk with you lovingly and say, I care about you so much. I want you to know that this thing is true. I want you to see what God has said. I want you to see all of the grace and the truth and the love in Scripture. And I want to spend time with you and I want to be around you so that I can impact you. That's a much different way of being. But it also doesn't pretend that standing on firm truth that some things are sinful is acting differently than Jesus. That is simply not true. Jesus would have never allowed someone to continue in their sin so that they could be close friends. Jesus would be truthful and still walk with them in love, but remain truthful. But this is counter to the message of the gospel. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. Now, salvation is a huge concept, right? It's a huge part of what we are as believers. We are people who are saved, who are redeemed, who are reborn, who were dead. Jesus would pray in the garden before the crucifixion, if there's any other way, God, let this cup pass from me. Now, think about that. If there is any other way than for me to suffer for the sins of those who would be saved, if there was any other way, Let's take that path. But that didn't happen. Jesus was tried in kangaroo court, scourged, paraded through town, forced to carry a cross, hung, and allowed to die, perhaps drowning in his own lungs as he worked to hold his body up. And this was God's wrath poured out against sin. Now to think that sin, which required blood, because without blood there is no remission of sin, sin that required blood should be winked at, excused, laughed at, joked about, and moved on past, would be criminal. But in our day today, and perhaps even increasingly, to talk about a holy standard, a holy requirement, to talk about a righteous, just God, to talk about one way of truth, is increasingly considered hate speech. You will be accused of hate speech. And so, we can start to understand how the psalmist maybe feels with people speaking against him, with people saying things about him that are untrue. The days are coming when as a Christian... We say, you know, we, we see that marriage is God's institution. We say that God looked at that poor man and said, it is not good that this dude would be alone. I'm going to make him from his rib a wife. And that that was the first marriage. And that this is how God has designed life to be. And that that is what marriage is. It is defined by God. As we say that, you will be called. You will be accused of hate speech. You will be accused of as, as a hateful, unloving person for simply saying that. Affliction. And so more and more increasingly as we look to Scripture as our source of truth as we present ideas as Christians into the world around us that are rooted in Scripture, we must be ready for affliction. And so it's important to see how does the psalmist react to this affliction? Because the way that we react is also important. We can react in absolute anger. We can fight against what's happening around us and we can spoil our witness. 
What if we just stood surely on the truth? What if it didn't anger us? What if we knew that it was coming? What if we always said, yep, I knew that people were going to be hatefully angry with me, and I was peacefully loving in response, but stayed firm in truth? Let's see what the psalmist says. Psalm 119, starting in verse 73 The psalmist cries out in the middle of affliction, Your hands have made and fashioned me. Now, what we're hearing here is like a counseling session. It's a counseling session of someone in the middle of trial, someone in the middle of frustration, someone who's got all this anger pent up inside himself, and he starts out by saying to God, God, you you made me, your hands fashioned me, I have a purpose found in you, I am what you intended to design, God, you are my God, you are my creator, that's encouraging in trial. I wonder, do we ever pray for God for comfort? You ever pray to God for comfort? I think we can tend to pray to God for things. We can tend to pray to God for outcomes. We can tend to pray to God and say, man, I wish, God, that this would be different in my life. I wish, God, that you would give me this thing. I wish, God, that you would give me a new job. I wish, God, that you would give me a mate or a spouse. I wish, God, that you would change my mate or my spouse's heart towards me. I wish, God, that you would do these things for me. But how often do we go to God and say, God, you're my creator, and I love you, and I need you right now in this moment. Everything around me in my life feels insane but God, you are my God. He prays, give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. It's not a proud heart. This is a humble heart. Give me understanding so I can even know you. God, I want to know you even more than I do. I want to know you even when I feel like I know all kinds of things about you. I want to know you, God, even more. Tell me about you. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Verse 74, those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. Those who fear you, God, they'll see me in the middle of trial, in the middle of struggle, in the middle of strife, in the middle of affliction. They'll see me as people speak negatively about me, as they say awful things about me, as they say I'm a hateful person, they'll see me and they'll rejoice. The Christian life is odd. Why would you see a fellow believer, a fellow God-fearer in the middle of a horrible time and rejoice, be filled with rejoice? Verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous. And get this, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Guys, that's a game changer. To be able to say, God, I know that in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. That's a game changer. If you can center your life around that, everything is different. If even in affliction, you know, you you cry out, God, you have afflicted me and you've done it in your faithfulness. I wonder, Christian, can you say that and mean it? When trouble comes, when trials come, when life doesn't feel good anymore, when people slander us and say we're hateful, when people say we have to do things that we don't want to do, is our first reaction, God, you've afflicted me. And in it, in the moment, in this feeling, in this second, right now, while everything is awful, God, you have allowed this and you're faithful in doing that. I know that Romans 8.28 says that you'll work all things out according to good for those who are called for your purposes. God, I know that right before Romans 8.28 is another verse, and right after Romans 8.28 is another verse. I know that in the full context of my trials, my trials and my sufferings are still trials, and it's still suffering. It doesn't always feel great, but I know that I can trust you, and I know your whole counsel in Scripture. I know that it shows me that you can bring people to the edge of the water with an entire national army behind them, and you can rescue them through impossible circumstances. God, I know that sometimes you don't rescue people. 
God, I know that sometimes it's, we suffer. I know that sometimes we're in the thick. I know that sometimes we hurt. And God, I know and I trust you in that moment. I know that as the people around me, my fellow believers, they see me in that moment, they can rejoice as your grace sees me through. They can rejoice as they see the witness of a believer suffering. It's so difficult to understand, but wouldn't you rather that kind of a faith? Isn't that a much stronger faith? Do you really believe that your life is going to be so easy that you can have a fragile, weak faith based on comfort, health, and just gifts and being surrounded by much? You really think faith in this life can survive that? If your whole faith is built up on God giving you everything you want, your faith can be easily destroyed. That's what the whole book of Job was about. First two chapters, first chapter is about how great Job's life is, how Job has everything. And then you get to chapter two. And Satan says to God, well, Job just loves you because you give him everything you want. And God says, that's not true. And, and he does something helpful. He says, here's what I'm going to let you do. Satan. I'll let you try Job because you say he's faithful because of stuff. I'll let you try him, but don't touch his health. Satan says, bet. He goes off to do his work. Now, here's what's interesting about that. God gave Satan a parameter that was strictly followed because he's an obedient devil? No. Because God is in sovereign control of all things. God says you may go this far and absolutely no further. And so you'll see the psalmist, he'll, he'll, he'll come to this point where he says, God, if I'm suffering, you have allowed it. And so that's why he can say, in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. If it's happening, God's allowed it. Why is this comfortable? This sounds awful. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to come to church and hear that I'm going to suffer and that God allows it. It's comforting because we can know that if God allows this, it's for a purpose. If God allows it, you know, I imagine um, there's, there's a revelation, the book of Revelation starts or has a, a, a scene. It's, it's the... Um, the Supper of the Lamb. And, and in, in, when you're seeing these descriptions of, of heaven, you, you hear of, of all tribes and tongues and nations, and you hear the, the angels are just worshiping God, worshiping God, and worshiping God. They've been in His presence from eternity past to all future eternity, and they're full of worship and praise, and every tribe and every tongue and every nation is present at the Supper of the Lord. I mean, you can't imagine what total unbridled glory and worship is like. And what if my temporary suffering allows someone to participate in that? What if my temporary suffering lets someone look on my life and say, if he can do it, I can do it. If he can survive this trial, I can survive this trial. Scripture says that God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God chooses the weak and I think we can tend to, we, we tend to elevate people. We tend to, we tend to celebrate people. We tend to be very, very proud of, 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 our, of leaders and eloquent speechers and, and, and you know, pastors with, with big ministries and, and putting them on television. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I think what we can do by elevating all these people is, is, is make us feel like, okay, well, my story is, maybe it's unimportant. Or the, the facts of my background are a little embarrassing, so I don't want to share them. I want everybody to think I'm okay. It is so important to share from, from truth of who we are. Whoever you are, whatever your story is, it's the one that God allowed. It's the, it's the testimony that God wants you to tell. If you became a believer as a four-year-old in your home church and have been a Christian your whole life, celebrate that testimony. Don't hide from that. Tell it. Share it. 
If you were saved, like my friend, a uh, friend of mine from New Mexico, Preston, with your head on a toilet paper roll, bleeding out of an artery in your armpit, I don't want to point, I'll point to the wrong side, whichever side it's on, that side, bleeding, and a, and a, and a, and a chaplain comes in and says, looks like things aren't going very well for you, buddy. If that's your story, share that story. Tell that story. People around us are dying, and they need to know truth. We need to worry less about elevating ourselves, less about how we look, and more about telling about God's goodness and his grace and his glory. And letting people know that you're living in sin and that separates you from God. I'm not judging you. I'm not perfect. I'm not great. I just want you to know that you're in sin. What if I wouldn't tell someone? I, I was a pretty hard-headed person. I said was. I was a pretty hard-headed person growing up. I was an uncomfortable person to share the gospel with. I would have mocked you, and I would have made fun of you. But at night, I was thinking about it. And today, I appreciate your testimony for telling me, for having the guts to come to someone as mean and abrasive as me and sharing gospel truth that my heart needed. It was hard, and it was hurt, and it was uncomfortable, and I didn't want to receive it, but I thought about it at night. I made you feel terrible, but I thought about it. And when things got awful and I was by myself and the lights were out, I thought on those things. They say, uh, Army says, uh, there's no such thing as atheists in foxholes. Right? When you get to the end of your life, whatever that means, when you're all by yourself and the lights are out, like I joke all the time, and guys that are here from North Carolina, you can try it. My challenge in this building is turn off all the lights on a dark night. Start at one end of the basement and walk slowly through there all by yourself and we'll watch on a night vision camera. You'll be creeped out. Biggest guy in here is going to be freaked out. We're afraid of what we don't know. And we know as people in this life, there's a God. You cannot deny it. I mean, it's called general revelation. If you want, you know, a 25-cent word, if you want to sound smart this afternoon, talk about general revelation. General revelation says, I can walk outside. I can look up at a sea of stars. I can see movement in a solar system. I can see that it's organized by seasons. I can know that our planet is at a slight axis so that we would have spring, summer, winter, fall. I may have gotten those in the wrong order. Forgive me. We could have growing seasons. The earth can kind of cool out. It can relax. It can replant. The animals tend to have babies in the right order. Men and women come together and they make more children. Men and men come together. They do not make more children. God has made everything with a purpose and an order. And it cannot be denied. And if you deny it, you are a fool. You're a fool. Affliction. Knowing that God allows affliction allows me to loosen my grip on this world. It allows me to feel a little less consumed and anxious when I'm afflicted. A little less consumed and angry when someone judges me. So I get it. That's this world. Jesus said, they came after me first. Expect a little yourself. That's not a direct quote. But it's close. They came after me first. You should at least expect some. So then I would say, if you get none, do you follow him? If everything you say sounds great to an unbeliever, sounds great to someone who is an enemy of God, never leaves them uncomfortable or challenged, are you faithful? Jesus Christ is not just Savior. He is Savior and Lord. Amen. Savior and Lord. And that's a big deal. Verse 76. Let your steadfast love comfort me. Now, I, I think this is prayer. I think this is desperation. I don't think this is bold slamming on a stump saying, I am comforted by you, God. I think it's, I'm at the end of myself. I'm afflicted. People are slandering me. People are saying lies about me. I'm so frustrated with them. I'm being treated differently. Everywhere I go, people are talking about me. I can hear it behind me. I'm treated differently by people that don't even know me because what's said about me, God, let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. This guy 
clings to promise. He clings so tight to promise. And this passage is structured in a shape that centers right here on promise. This is a poetic structure that brings your attention straight into the promise. It's talking all about affliction. All affliction is all over the place and dead in the middle is God, your promise. That's what I'll cling to. Verse 77, let your mercy come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. Your law is my delight. I'm going to tell you in this moment, I don't think he's feeling that. I can't promise you, but I don't think he's feeling it. I think he's coaching himself up. He says, God, I want to delight in your law. I want you to teach it to me. I want to be comforted by you. I want it to be true that your mercy comes to me, God, so that I can even live. I want your law to be my delight. Now, we don't know what promise he's holding on to here. In fact, we don't even know who the psalmist is. Could be David, could not. And I I like that. I like that ambiguity. What promise does he hold on to? I don't know. It doesn't tell you. I'll ask you back. What promise do you hold on to? I've encouraged us in the past to study God's promises. There's so many books of just books of God's promise. They're all over scripture. What if you hid that away in your heart so that you would not sin against him by not trusting him in trial? What if the verses you hide away in your heart were those that contained God's promises to you? That's the center of the psalmist's entire prayer in this section about affliction is promise. Here's a couple of promises I pulled out just in study this week. Second that's easy for you to say. Second Thessalonians 3:3. 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. He will establish you and he will guard you against the evil one. Christian, God guards us. God keeps us safe from the evil one. And so part of what that means is then I don't go play around with the stuff where I'm being guarded against. Right? I mean, think about a, you know, I'll simplify this a little bit. Think about a bodyguard. Maybe you've got somebody that's a bodyguard. Maybe you're, you're kind of a, you know, getting picked on or something, so you hire some kid. You're smart. You're enterprising. You say, okay, that's a big guy. I'll pay him to protect me. And so you go into the bathroom where the bullies usually pick on you. You know, maybe you smack him in the face because it's funny. And you turn around and your bodyguard's not there. <laughs> Less funny in that moment. Now, God is present and God is able, but we shouldn't play with evil things. If it's something that we require to be protected from, we shouldn't go and play with that. Jesus says, if something causes you to sin, pluck out your eye. Now, does Jesus really want you to pluck out your eye? Eh, Probably not. Right? Probably not. But what is he saying? Right? It's like an object lesson. Does your mom think you're going to go jump off of a bridge? No. She's making a point. If everyone else was jumping off of a bridge, would you? She's blowing it up and making it ridiculous so that you'll see how stupid the thing that you're doing is. Playing around with sin, Jesus blows it up so that you see how stupid that is. Um, are you, do you struggle with alcohol or drugs? How stupid would it be to put yourself in that situation? That's what Jesus says. Pluck the eye out. Take big moves to be away from that thing. Is pornography a weakness for you? Take big moves to be away from that. It's not good for you. It separates you from Christ. And that particular example takes out a whole host of people with it. It's not funny. It's not to be toyed with. Pluck out your eye. Romans 5.8 But God shows his love for us that while we, will, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. That's a promise. You can take that to the bank. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Amen. I hate to hear sometimes. I remember a young man one time, he said, you know what? Um, 
I can't come to church because I come in and everybody's got it all worked out. Everybody's happy. And nobody has problems in their life. And I'm so messed up, I can't even go there. And I just want to take this thing and just throw it across the room and say they're all liars. Everybody in this place is confused and terrified. Like I said, when the lights go out, there's no atheists in foxholes. If you were to stand before a holy, righteous God, fear. But God in the man, Christ Jesus, showed his love for us while we were still sinners. Never said, hey, why don't you pick yourself up by your bootstraps? Right? Here's a lie. God loves those who help themselves. Lie. I mean, he may love you because he loves all creation. He loves all of his children. He loves all people. He never said, get better and come to me. That's a lie. He said, you're unable to get better. And so I've sent my son Jesus to die murderously, kind of hoping it catches your attention. And by the shedding of blood, by the remission of blood, by a, by a system that was set up uh, with a little lamb, and you'd, you'd pet it, you'd pet the lamb, and you'd keep it in your house, in your living room, and then you would kill it, and then you would cook it, and everybody had to eat all of it before the sun would go down, or you'd burn it on the fire. This was supposed to leave an impact on our lives. The cost of sin is high, and it's great, and it's not to be toyed with. And in the middle of struggle, in the middle of strife, in the middle of trial, the psalmist says, God, I cling to your I cling to your promise. And as New Testament believers, we get to see the ultimate promise. Salvation in Christ is ours. It's to be treasured. What if you think of trial as people speaking negatively about you? Slander is damaging. You can lose your job over this stuff, right? The, the very way that you provide for yourself and that you provide for your family is vulnerable as a Christian. In our world today, we've got to hide the word of God away in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. And parents, parents, we have to show our children that we live to please an audience of one and not find friends in the world. Now, hear me, I'm not saying be obtuse, I'm not saying be a jerk. I think you should be winsome, but I think you should be honest. I don't think you should shirk away from truth. Because what's going on in the world around us, if your eyes are even open, is insane. Um, just the other day, the, uh, the mayor of our own town, um, he owns a, a bookstore across town. Awesome bookstore, actually. Um, he just had a uh, um, uh, drag queen story night for kids. So, get, you know, gather up the kids, you know, let's finish up spaghetti dinner at the table, and we'll head down to the bookstore, and the drag queens are going to read us all a story. It's a children's, children's story. Now, do I think that that is a sinful environment? Yes. Do, do I love every single drag queen in that building? Absolutely. I would hug them. I would love them. I would tell them that Jesus loves them so much. And I will tell you what, and, and here's how I bring this up. Here's why I bring this up. Because if, if you're at work and you're at the water cooler and you're having this conversation, and someone says, oh, you go to church, what, what do you think about that? Are you, you cool with that? And say, well, you know, I would say that uh, God says that sex is to be enjoyed in the construct of marriage, and that marriage is a man and a, a woman coming together and, and agreeing in, in matrimony for, for the rest of their days in sickness and in health, that they will love each other and each other only, and through that, they will, they will image God to the world around them, I would say, do we, get love? do we get married because we love each other? No, we get married because we think it will glorify God and we orient everything about our marriage, not around a feeling, not around how my heart flickers when someone's around, but around how do I glorify God through this? Then yeah, I would say that this is, this is sin. And there are a lot of places where you would be very quickly and easily fired for saying that. This is the world that's coming. We're just at the beginning, but it's, it's going to get hot and heavy. And I say that as someone who works very much in the world. Um, so I was talking with somebody, I forget where it was, a doctor. Was it in the U.K., Nicholas? A doctor in the U.K. Um, was actually just fired for refusing to call a, a six-foot, one-inch man a woman, right? In medical profession. You know, if you're a medical professional, you may get a memo that says you cannot deny gender-based care for anyone. Now think about that. 
you can't deny gender-based care. I'm not going to dive too far into what that means, but just think about it. We're getting to the point where we're denying plain science because of the way people might feel or the way you might be perceived. And don't be confused. It's not that anybody believes it. It's all about legality, right? It's all about libel. We're very much a a sue-happy culture. Nobody wants to get sued. It's man-pleasing projected into the world. We have got to teach our children not to be man-pleasing people. I think just... I think there's whole sections sometimes as as Christians in the world that we're just not reading in Scripture or we're not believing or we're kind of closing our eyes. You know, like, you ever play hide-and-go-seek with a toddler? It's great because they think if they can't see you, you also can't see them. Um, Matthew 10, 28, still in my Bible. Here's how that reads. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's a hard sell today, right? That's a hard sell today. Does it make it less true? We've got to wrestle with this stuff. Christianity is not, well, say popcorn and bubblegum, which is funny because there is a popcorn maker in the back of the room, but Christianity is not kind of goofy, jokey stuff. There is cost to being a Christian now. Used to be benefit. It was like the way in the country club, right? It would pave the way for an easier life if you were a believer because you had all kinds of connections from church. It brought you gain. Christianity is starting to have cost. Stick with the psalmist, verse 78. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. I love that second part, because that's our reaction, right? So if we're working our way down through this, we see that when we come into affliction, when we're surrounded by slander, we concentrate on the promises of God, we go to him in prayer for comfort, and he says, let the insolent be put to shame. By who? By him? Let me go confront my accuser, let me show everybody how wrong they are, let me put them down, let me build myself back up, let me get back my reputation in the world. No, he says, as for me... As for my part, God, I will meditate on your precepts. I'll be in the word. I'll trust you in this situation. If you're allowing me to be afflicted, I trust you in it. I think the psalmist is praying for the strength to do these things. I don't think he's storming in the room saying, well, everybody's talking down on me. I just concentrate on your word, God. I trust you. I'm comfortable with this. I think this guy's hurting. And here he says in verse 79 and 80, Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. So can we say with the psalmist that this is how we will react in affliction and in trial and when people speak against us? I think we can pray for that. I think he's praying for that. I don't think he storms in the middle of the situation and says, I'm nailing this thing. I think he's praying to God for help. He's praying to God for support. He's praying to God in the middle of this for understanding. So how will we react in affliction and in trial when people speak against us? Will we fight for our honor? Or will we trust our God and stand in truth? In the middle of Jesus' own suffering, he says, and we read in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is Jesus' example for us. 
great suffering, great trial. Jesus' life was not a cakewalk. His life was tough. So let's pray with the psalmist that our afflictions, that in our afflictions, that through our afflictions we would cling to God, maybe more tightly. Maybe we could say, like Romans 8, 27 through 28, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If God is allowing things and we're complaining, who do we complain against? We have to be really careful with that. I tend to have a complaining spirit, right? That's my tendencies. Uh, and I think as, as, as Americans, that's kind of a cultural thing for us as well. Right? One of the first things that we tend to do is kind of be complainy, kind of just like make fun of things, right? be a little bit angsty. Um, first thing that somebody does, hey, how are you doing? You give them the reasons why you're tired. You tell them how hard you've been working. You tell them how much you've been awake. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I've been working a lot. Things are pretty tough. I just wonder what that does to our spirit over time. Just a constant state of disappointment. What if we just reoriented our mind and say, you know, I'm going to concentrate on things above. When somebody asks me, hey, how are you doing? What if I just decide I'm going to focus on something positive for that day? What if every day I set aside, I want to see God, I want to see your glory in this day. I want to rejoice in you in this day. I want to put to death in me the tendency to complain, and I want to bring to life in me the tendency to magnify you, because I want people around me to see you, not my weird complaining spirit. God, I want people to see that I'm excited. Why? because of you what if we lived our lives in that way that would be impactful and then in the middle of affliction what if people rejoice because of our affliction because of the way we carried ourselves in it I think that's what the psalmist is saying people who fear you rejoice in my affliction because they look and they say wow he's going through it and celebrating God see that in Job that's what we see in Job What happens when Job, everybody around him has died, his family, his livestock, his houses, his children, his wife says, curse God and die. He rejoices because he knows his God is more than this life. Join me, let's pray. God, we thank you so much that our lives are so much more than just the the simple temporal pleasures of this life the 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 things the stuff the feelings but God that our lives are built around the truth of your glory and built around the forgiveness of your son and built around the fact that you rebear us and renew us and take hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh and that your spirit indwells us and God that we get to celebrate you in glory forever and so this short temporary life God make it one that we use for your glory and for your kingdom Even as we go about this week, God, when we go out into our jobs, will you give us hearts that are reminded to be excited of your glory, not projecting and magnifying our suffering, God, but that projecting and magnifying you. God, would you correct us in those moments where we try to focus and wallow and struggle and strife and misery? God, would you make us be joyous people who know that we'll live together forever with you and your kingdom? And God, if there was anybody in this room this morning who has never known your son Jesus savingly as both Savior and Lord, would you cause them to turn to your son today as source of truth, repent from their own understanding of life, trust you forever, cling to your son Jesus to be forgiveness, and that they'll become your child today, now, in this moment. God, I pray that they would accept grace and truth in your son and worship you forever. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.